excited to be here today. Um, I'm a contemplative neuroscientist, and I've been in the field about a little over a decade. So I thought I might share with you today what I see as the, sci the science of meditation, where it's been, where it is, and where it's going. So this conference, I was here last year as well, and it seems like a big theme is to integrate and the tension between the old and the new, conservers and adapters, tradition and modernity. And for the last 20 years, I would say science has, science has been firmly on the side of the adapters. And as an adapter has thrown out anything that does, is not congruent with the modern worldview and also makes an effort to appeal to the values of, of, of modern society. So it's probably not surprising that karma and rebirth haven't really made the cutoff in, in, in the science, scientific part of the Dharma. Now, as, as the Dharma and meditation has made its way into medicine, and now is being applied to pretty much everything from back pain to writer's block, there's been another quiet casualty of modern Dharma cherry picking. And that is that, <laughs> posture, that's one of them. Um, that is the liberative teachings of the Dharma itself, pretty much the centerpiece, if you want to call it enlightenment. Um, that's also been dismissed as religious folklore. Now, if you're going to dismiss liberation, um, you might as well just throw out Buddhism, too. <laughs> so, there, so science finds itself in a bit of a bind. On one hand, there's this like massive, you know, Everyone's going crazy for meditation. There's actually a, more than a million new meditators in the, every year in America alone. So that's on one hand. And on the other hand, this sort of dogmatic distancing against anything that's considered religious. So how, how are you going to describe the point and the goal of meditation if you're not allowed to use, talk about enlightenment or Buddhism? So that's kind of the bind with that that science finds itself in. Now, you have to remember that science is actually really good at precision. Think about a uh, chemistry lab in, in high school. You have like these specific chemicals. It's all in a manual. The goal is preset. You do step one. You put them together. It turns black and bubbles. You do step two. It's systematic and it's precise, right? That's what science is really good at. But something very bizarre is happening in contemplative science, which is that we're using really unbelievably vague language. It's, it's really uncharacteristic of science. So one of the most obvious examples of this is just the word meditation. Um, as you know, that doesn't actually really mean anything. And we use it all the time. And actually, if you look in scientific articles, it'll be like the effect of meditation. Um, and we use it like it's this monolithic entity, but it's actually like a really, really vague term. So the next term, um, that's, we've, we've improved a little bit on the, on the meditation front. We ha now we have like three practices, I think, in, in medicine and science. But um, now there's, a, there's sort of a new iteration of this vagueness, and that's the term mindfulness. Um, mindfulness is now standing for both a trait, a state, a practice, and the goal all in one. In fact, um, John Kabat-Zinn recently in, a, in an article in Contemporary Buddhism said, you know, I never meant the term mindfulness to be anything specific. I actually meant it to be a placeholder, an umbrella term for the entire dharma. So if people who were, who were kind of looking to him for the, for the definition of mindfulness as something specific, especially scientists, um, were like, what? You know, we didn't realize that, that he never meant it to be something specific. So it's also probably not surprising that the term mindfulness has proliferated well beyond whatever John Kabat-Zinn meant. <laughs> and also what was meant in the original Buddhist traditions. <laughs> so I'll let you soak this in a little. <laughs> so the term mindfulness is not only caught on and become very popular in pop, uh, not only in pop culture, but also in science. This graph is actually a graph of NIH grants. And you can see that in blue, and the two bottom ones are meditation and yoga, which are actually real things. And then the med and mindfulness. <laughs> mindfulness has actually bypassed those. So scientists are also just using this word as if it were something real. Um, one of the culprits of this mindfulness explosion 
is the popularity of, of mindfulness self-report scales. Now, self-reports are a lot easier to use in medicine and in, in research than to actually make people meditate and you know, re, re, um, measure something before and after. That's a, that's a lot of burden. So it's a lot easier to just use mindfulness um, as, as a, as a self-report scale. They take about two minutes to fill out. So one of the problems with these self-report scales is that they give us a very simplistic way of, of the way they think that maybe the, the path is going to outline. <laughs> so you show up at the clinic here in extreme misery. At some point, you'll be totally OK. Um, if you keep meditating, even better than that. And then someday, you'll be the best. Um, and and as, as we know, that's not really the way it happens. And, and we were, we're all laughing, but actually, people think this is the way it's supposed to go. And when it doesn't go this way, um, they become very disheartened and sometimes ashamed. It's actually kind of a terrible thing. Um, the other problem is that we're using these scales actually to measure expertise. Because we don't, because scientists are, are not trained in, we're really ignorant about um, the traditional definitions of contemplative development, we're using these scales to define what contemplative development looks like. So. <laughs> This is, a, this is a term, I didn't make it up. This was a term that was floating around a lot last year. I just found this awesome graphic to go with it. Um, and it's really, McMindfulness is really pointing to um, this really amazing enthusiasm behind um, meditation that's not backed up by a lot of precision. And that's sort of what I mean by McMindfulness. OK, so McMindfulness has um, a lot of real world consequences that are quite problematic. Now, for the, for the average person that's learning to meditate, there's a, it's just a lot of confusion. What exactly, what exact practice am I supposed to be doing? And what's, what's, what's going to happen if I do this practice? And how do I know if I'm doing it well? And these are just some of the ideas that are kind of floating around. And nobody's really sure which one's right. So we have no, no afflictive emotions, selflessness, refined attention, compassion, positive emotions, acceptance. These are all things that are floating around. And then the goals are even more vague. Happiness, end of suffering, well-being. It's really, it's not, think back to chem lab. This is not what, this, what the path is looking like. Um, so this is sort of just for the average practitioner. Now, for the scientists, the lack of precision about states and stages is actually pretty devastating. This is a little bit complicated. So what we have here is experienced meditators, um, in quotes, on the right, and controls on the left on some measure of interest. And this is just a made up graph. So I just said put attention in there, because that's a really common one. And again, because scientists don't have a background in what makes up contemplative expertise, what types of practices should be, um, that there is any different, any different kinds of practices, um, scientists have defaulted into hours of practice as that's what makes somebody a good meditator. Um, and so you can see this, this, this is one of the problems that happens. So these guys on the bottom, I'll just come over here. Um, so these guys on the bottom, they've been meditating 5,000 hours, an hour every day, they've been following their breath, really diligent, they have no idea why. Um, <laughs> They, like, they, they, they have, you, if you ask them what the difference between shamatha and vipassana is, they'd be like, I've never heard of those words. Um, this is a common thing in America, by the way. Um, up here, these guys, they trained with Upendita and Pa'ok. They know exactly what they're doing. And there's, they, but they're both considered equal because they all have 5,000 hours. Um, and there's a, there's a euphemism, which is perfect practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So the quality of your practice matters. And, and as scientists, we haven't been taking that into account. And so what, what the, one of the, the devastating consequences of, of that is that in this model, the, the mean, which is these red lines that you can maybe not quite see, um, they're not different than each other. This is basically saying that there's no difference between meditators and controls on attention. There's no effect of meditation on attention. Um, and so basically, meditation has no effect. You think like, well, those scientists don't really think that. Well, actually, they do. Um, <laughs> so this is actually the most this is actually the most recent government re report on the state of the research of meditation. So this is sort of like the official word of the government. 
It was over 400 pages. It reviewed over 800 studies, and it's really long, so you have to find the, like, the actual conclusions at the bottom. And they say, as a whole, firm conclusions on the effects of meditation practices in healthcare cannot be drawn based on the available evidence. Basically, there's no effective meditation. The central problem, confusion over what constitutes meditation. So how can this be the case? And this, I think for a lot of people, we think that there's so much proof that you know, science is proving that meditation and works and all these things, that that's actually that's way overhyped to, compared to like, the actual reality of the situation. So how could this have happened? And I think that you know, it's not all our fault as scientists. I think there's a deeper uh, cultural phenomenon going on, which I'm going to try to illustrate with what I call the blobology effect. The blobology effect, very simply said, is that when you show people, um, when people see colorful blobs on a brain scan, they, they'll con be convinced of anything. <laughs> They can be convinced of anything, even if what you're saying makes no sense, or if it's absolutely preposterous. And even further, people will, will believe brain scans over their own experience. And so there was a study, you've probably seen it, that, um, that the, there was a study that found that brain, the same brain areas light up when you see your cell phone as when you see a loved one. And so people have been concluding that my God, I must be in love with my cell phone. Like, I didn't know that. You know, should I tell my wife? Um, and so it's... The, so the blobology effect on a deeper level is really a symbol of the imbalance between the, in, the inner and outer technologies. Our sense of ourselves, what's going on in our own minds and bodies, is so impoverished that we have to look to colorful blobs on a brain scan to tell us whether we're in love or in pain. Um, and, you know, I know there's a lot of excitement about these brain imaging technologies to sort of be this Dharma technology to move things forward, but we're not really there yet. The technology is not there, and it's not because this technology isn't there, it's because this one isn't. The inner technology isn't developed enough, and, it's, and until those two, de, two technologies become even and the inner technology catches up with the outer one, we won't be able to use brain imaging technology to its fullest extent. And until then, our love affair with colorful blobs is really just a marketing opportunity and represents the poverty of our inner technology. Oops. Oh, I should have a blank slide in there, but I guess I don't. So I think everything um, that I've told you so far has been um, kind of a buzzkill. So... <laughs> But it's, it's going to come around, don't worry, it's going to get better. Um, so I told all of this to the National Institute of Health, and I said, listen, based on your report that you, just, that you just released, it looks like the state of meditation research is in crisis, and that the scientists, we really don't have any precision about um, states and stages or, or, or contemplative expertise. Um, we pretty much have no idea what we're talking about. And I think that you should pay me as an ignorant scientist, um, for five years to study Buddhist texts. And they said, OK. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so that's my job now. But this is, this is, I'm just one tiny little sliver of a much larger revolution, um, which is what I call contemplative science 2.0, the hybrid revolution. And this is something that was masterminded by the Mind and Life Institute, founded by the Dalai Lama, the um, neuroscientist Francisco Varela, and entrepreneur Adam Engel, who I think is here. Adam, are you here? There he is, back there. Woo! Um, so, so their idea was to create a new generation of contemplative scientists hybrids who are duly trained, both in the... Uh, traditional and, and sometimes contemplative, uh, sorry, monastic aspects of the Dharma, but also the scientific and neuroscientific training. So here's a picture of this new generation. This was taken at the uh, first International Contemplative Studies Symposium that was in Denver actually in April. And don't be thrown off by their Burning Man-esque attire because they represent 
um, more than 70 peer-reviewed articles in high top-tier journals, and more than $15 million in research funds. Um, this year was a very important year for the, for the new generation. Mind and Life officially passed the torch to this new generation um, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And, you know, they're doing things really differently. Because they have the inner technologies themselves, they can see the, the McMindfulness and the Blobology and say, hey, wait, this is a distraction. This isn't really what this is about. You know, we can do better. And they're really going back to the texts. So one of the new, new developments is to you know, go back to the Vasudhimaga, see if you can create the Buddhist personality scale from that based on greedy, aversive, and deluded. And this is the psychometric analysis of that coming out soon. Um, maybe we can actually define mindfulness by the four foundations of mindfulness through the Satipatthana Sutta. Get, um, this is Bhikkhu Analyo helping us with that. Um, and he's not only Theravadan, but he's also German. So... <laughs> If you want precision, we got it covered. So challenging McMindfulness. Another thing the new generation is doing is taking on McMindfulness, this very general scale, and really challenging it at its root level, which is face validity. If a scale is worth anything, it should be able to differentiate between, if it's measuring, something, if it's measuring mindfulness, it should be able to differentiate between somebody who should be mindful, like everyone agrees that person should be mindful, um, and, and the opposite, those people should not be mindful. So, for example, comparing long-term meditators with binge drinkers. And this is, this is one of the studies. Thai monks with American college students. <laughs> um, an eight-week training in meditation or tango lessons. So how do these scales do? In all three cases, this, these groups were deemed more mindful. Um, by these scales. So this is, just, this is just an exposure that these scales are not measuring something that we wanted to be measuring, and it's just a nail in the coffin of McMindfulness. Another um, project that I wanted to tell you about because I think it's particularly promising is the Contemplative Development Mapping Project, which is an in interdisciplinary attempt to um, identify signposts of a contemplative development by combining both inner and outer technologies. So we have two Mahasi monks, a sociologist, two neuroscientists, two clinical uh, psychologists, a philosopher, and a comparative religion scholar, and then lots and lots and lots of uh, Dharma teachers giving us feedback. So remember the linear progress, this is what we're trying to improve upon. So maybe we can, by, by going back to the text, and also actually talking to practitioners about their experience. And now, thank thankfully, there is, with the new pragmatic Dharma movement, people are actually talking about their experience and we can get a sense of kind of what's happening. Um, maybe the path isn't this simple. Maybe it looks more like this. This is the progress of insight from the Vasudhimaga. Um, and this is just the worst part of it. Um, but, you know, noticing that it's not linear and that it's also not all calm and bliss. Um, and this may, we were actually studying, um, we have a study actually on this, on this looking at uh, people going through the stages of insight, especially the difficult stages, and maybe that will be an unconference session on its own. But maybe this, maybe this little, is just a snapshot of the contemplative path, um, and maybe that if you practice long enough, it actually looks more like this, and that there's, you, you cycle through these cycles many times, um, that there's many insight cycles. Or actually what we're finding is probably closer to this, is that there's many cycles within a meta-cycle. So there's, there's both cycles within cycles. So again, the new generation is, is basically taking this really oversimplified um, view of things and merging inner and outer technologies to give us a little bit nuanced and more accurate version of what it might be like. Um, and then, this is Jared Lindahl, he's our comparative religion scholar, and he's mapping contemplative development across traditions, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, you know, seeing whether anything can match up. And that's a whole, that's a complicated endeavor, I'll tell you. Um, but we're trying to see whether to get rid of a lot of the religious and value-laden language and move into a more universal and descriptive language. So saying things like, this person has, you know, has established attentional stability, or they have a sensory sampling rate of greater than 40 hertz, using descriptive language rather than words like, this person's an anagami or an arhat. 
Um, that, that type of uh, value-laden and religious language has caused a lot of problems. Um, tends to piss people off a lot. Um, so in the next talk, Daniel Ingram will be filling in this next, the, the universal and descriptive um, section with a lot more uh, detail about what he thinks should go in there. Okay, so basically I think that this group, this new, this new generation, along with all you guys, which is, I've, this is all you guys, um, has really, is really bringing together, bringing the inner and outer technologies that science really craves, and also putting science and liberation um, where they belong, which is, which is not in one camp or the other, but as timeless and eternally relevant. And the one last thing I wanted to say um, was that last year somebody said, I think it was Rohan, um, that radical innovation and transformation never comes from incumbent power structures. And I'd like to say I think that things might be changing. Thank you.